Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome back to our lecture series. Before I get started with today's talk, did you all enjoy the movie yesterday? Yes. yes. Really good movie. Did you enjoy the popcorn, more importantly? Yes. <laughs> Anthony told me afterwards they kept calling down to, to guest services or to the dining room saying, we need more popcorn, we need more popcorn. These people are going through it like locusts. We need more popcorn. And they ran out, I think. So uh, anyway, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I've had several questions from people coming up to me about things that happened in the movie. Does anyone, let me, before we start today, does anyone have any questions? Having seen the movie, heard my talk yesterday, any other follow-up that we need in terms of that period in history and what happened uh, in this region? Any other questions? Great, you guys know everything now. That's, that's wonderful. Um, I did have a question about the royal family, um, the royal family of Saudi Arabia. The Hashemite rulers, particularly Hussein bin Ali, who was the king of the Hejaz, he, his area was conquered, his son was deposed by the family Saud, still the, which is still the royal family of Saudi Arabia, uh, Abdulaziz ibn Saud, they first had controlled the area called the Naj, which is Riyadh, that's why Riyadh is the capital, and then later on, the, they conquered most of the rest of the uh, Saudi the Arabian Peninsula, with the exception of the very southern part, and that was because the British were controlling that, and the British, after having supported first the Hashemite family, and then having lied to them, they then supported the, the Saud family in conquering the Hejaz and the Hashemite family. And so in the 1920s, the uh, family Saud with the first ruler, Abdulaziz Ibn Saud, Ibn means son of, so he was of that family, he took over. And I just had a question about, but yeah, there seems to, when was the first king? Because there seems to be so many of them. Well, Abdulaziz Ibn Saud had multiple wives and he had 45 sons and multiple daughters. And so the family Saud has continued to be very prolific in their reproduction ever since then. So the, the royal family, those who are uh, related to family Saud, the royal family of Saudi Arabia is huge uh, because Abdulaziz started all that with all of his sons and daughters. Okay, so just a little bit of information. Today we're talking about the mysteries of the Nabataeans and Petra. The Nabataeans being the people who, while they weren't the first ones to be settled in this place, they were the ones that built the city that you're going to see in a few days when we get to Jordan and travel up to Petra. Um, this is uh, where we are today. We're into the May lectures. This afternoon we will have the first of two lectures about Egypt in preparation for our visit to Luxor and the Valley of the Kings, the Karnak Temple, the Luxor Temple, etc. This afternoon we will talk fairly general terms about the history of Egypt, give you a little background. We'll talk uh, some about hieroglyphics, uh, those sorts of things. And then tomorrow, tomorrow morning uh, at 10 o'clock, we will have a talk with Ava, and she, she wanted to emphasize that this is a less formal presentation, but we're doing it in here because of needing to show slides. She's going to be talking about icons. And again, this will be very helpful and valuable to you uh, leading up to our visit to St. Catherine's Monastery and their extraordinary collection of icons there. Most of which you won't be able to see, but the ones they have in the museum still are, will knock your eyes out. And so she'll talk about that tomorrow at 10 in the morning in here, and then tomorrow afternoon I will do the second of our Egypt talks, which is Pharaoh's Temple and Tomb, Temples and Tombs, in specific preparation for what you will see and what you can expect when we are in Luxor, okay? I keep. Uh, I continue to put this up here, the website where you will be able to find the videos of these lectures. In addition to the videos, and, and Carolyn is set up so that she can try to capture the, the images here as well, but all of these PowerPoints will be there as well. And you can just open these PowerPoints, you can print them out, uh, they will include the lists of the classes and that, the lectures and that sort of thing. So all of this will be available to you as well. All right, let's talk about the mysteries of the Nabataeans and Petra. We have to give you a little history here, at least modern history. The story of Petra begins, or from our point of view, with a Swiss explorer whose name was Johann Ludwig Berkart. Berkart was born toward the end of the, 19th, of the 18th century, and when he was in his early 20s, he traveled, he'd been educated in, uh, in Austria, in his homeland, but he moved in his early 20s to England, and when he went to England, he did it with a specific desire of getting support to become a, an explorer. The 
19th century especially, and he was early on in the 19th century, was the period of great exploration. That was the time of David Livingstone being in Africa, you know, Dr. Livingstone, I assume, or presume, and all of these other people, especially Africa, parts of the Middle East, were unexplored by the West at that point. And so Burkhart, in his early 20s, went to Britain and to England. He ended up spending some time studying at Oxford, studying, studying Arabic, but he approached a man named Sir Joseph Banks. Joseph Banks was a member of the, the Africa Society, it was called, the, or I'm sorry, the Africa Association, and they were supporters of exploration in Africa. He was also um, a member of the Royal Society of Scientists and Explorers, and so they, they would fund people doing these sorts of things. The search for the source of the Nile, the search for the source of the Zambezi River, Burkhart proposed that they support his efforts to find the source of the Niger River, one of the other major rivers in Africa. Because by following the rivers, they since, since cultures tend to be along rivers. Remember Mes Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers? Um, and so exploring the rivers was how these Western, especially British explorers, discovered the dark continent of Africa, for instance. Well, Burkhart got accepted for support to visit the, the Middle East and the plan was for him to go to Africa. He ended up after a couple of years of studying Arabic in Britain at, um, he, and he was a fascinating guy. He was convinced that the best way for him to explore areas that were predominantly Muslim was to be so fluent in Arabic and so fluent in Islamic law that he could pass for an Arab Muslim. In fact, this is how he dressed, and you'll notice the name in parentheses, Sheikh Ibrahim ibn Abdallah. He called himself Sheikh Ibrahim ibn Abdallah. When he left Britain, he stopped for a time in Malta, the island of Malta, to further his studies. And in Malta, he heard about um, a, an explorer who had been killed, but the stories had come back that he had found a lost city. Now, Petra had not been heard of for well over 500 years. It was just a rumor that there was this stone city somewhere in the desert. They didn't know where it was. Nobody from the West knew anything about it. It was a lost city. Well, from Malta, Burkhart went on to Syria. He lived in Aleppo for a while and got a Christian Arab to help him become completely fluent in Arabic. He also studied Islamic law and to the, to the point where his Arabic was so good and his knowledge of Islam was so good, he really did pass as an a, a, uh, Islamic scholar in the places where he traveled. After spending some time studying in Aleppo in Syria, he headed south, still hearing stories about this hidden city. He traveled throughout the Middle East, visiting uh, various desert areas. In fact, he was responsible in Egypt for finding the temple of Ramses II at Abu Simbel. We will not see that. It's a little further south than we're going to go. But if you see, if you've ever seen these four huge seated statues of Ramses II seated outside the door of this temple, that's Abu Simbel, and he's the one that discovered that. Well, along the way, as he was traveling in in 1812, traveling down into the desert areas, he heard because they thought he was he was an Arab. He heard some Bedouins talking about this amazing stone city that was nearby, and so he convinced them to take him, particularly so that he could offer a sacrifice at the, at the tomb of Aaron, the older brother of Moses, who was supposedly buried there. Well, they take him in, in August, August 22nd of 1812, they take him through what we will see, the Sikh, the, the Stone Canyon, and this was the first image that he saw as he came out of that stone canyon, the sea. He visited there. He didn't have a chance to spend a lot of time because he was afraid it would be obvious that he wasn't necessarily who he purported to be. And if they realized that he was a Westerner, he was not Arabic, and he was not Islamic, then you know they certainly would have done away with it. So he, he saw all this. One of the things that was important about Burkhart is he kept track, he kept journals. Of all of the things he saw, everywhere he went, he did maps, and he would send these things back to England every chance he got, every time he got close to a port or anywhere he could send things back. So we have all of the materials that he collected during that time. After seeing um, the 
the extraordinary city of Petra that had been lost for over 500 years. He ended up, after a while, sending those things back. Ten years after he was actually there, in 1822, all of the details of this, some of the, his maps, the description of it, were published in England, and that started a flood of visitors. The tourist trade started booming in the 1820s for Petra. Unfortunately, by that time, Burkhardt was no longer with us because he traveled so much, he endured such hardships that he ended up contracting several diseases, including dysentery. He recovered from it at one point. He had gone, he'd gone to Cairo and was waiting in Cairo to prepare to take a, a caravan trip to Timbuktu, which is in a modern-day Mali in West Africa, in order to begin, he hadn't even started yet, to begin the search for the Niger. Well, he had a reoccurrence of dysentery, and he died when he was, um, let's see, was it uh, 32, I think? Um, yeah, at age 32, from dysentery in Cairo. And it was after that, that was in 1817, it was after that that they published his reports, his stories, and people in Britain began to learn about this ancient city of Petra. Now, Petra is called, has been called the Rose Red City. Um, Smithsonian Institute said this is one of the 28 places you absolutely must see before you die. And it's called the Rose City because it is made out of this sort of rose colored, in some places it's golden, in some places it's more red, but generally rose colored sandstone. The entire city is carved out of this sandstone. Now, this Arab gentleman is standing at the top. This is just the pedestal at the top of the tower of the El Dair, which is the monastery on top of the mountain. You can see you're looking down. This is the first sight that you will get when you walk through the sea. This is the treasury, it's called, al Kazne, And um, it's not actually a treasury. I'll tell you about that in a minute. What happened was, um, when he discovered this, sent word back after five centuries, people, people found out about it. There's always been a fascination, of course, with lost cities, with these various civilizations. I mean, the finding of various Asian places. This is a very early painting of uh, al Dair, the monastery, which is on top of the mountain. That's the... This is the top of that, okay? Wow. This is all carved out of stone. None of these, are be these buildings are built. They're carved out of the raw rock. And there are various time periods represented in all of these carvings, but they are quite extraordinary. So, all of this is the product of a group of people called the Nabataeans. And so, who were the Nabataeans? Oh, by the way, I, I meant to mention that Petra has also been named one of the seven wonders, the new seven wonders of the world. You know, there were the seven wonders of the ancient world? Well, Petra is one of the seven new wonders of the world, which also include Chichen Itza, uh, Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil, the Great Wall of China, Machu Picchu in Peru, the, um, the Roman Colosseum in Rome, and the Taj Mahal in India. And so Petra is considered in that rank in terms of importance as a monument. Well, the Nabataeans were a group of people that uh, there's still a lot of mystery associated with it. They, it, for one thing, we're not sure exactly where they came from. Um, some people have proposed that because of the name, they might have been descended from Nabioth. Nabioth was the oldest son of Ishmael. Remember Ishmael? Ishmael, who was the son through Hagar, from the first son of Abraham. Ishmael was the father of the Arabic peoples. His oldest son, the first tribe that came after Ishmael was the tribe of Nabioth, and it's thought that might be the source of this particular group of people, but we don't know for sure. The most common idea is that they were Arabic tribal peoples from further down in Saudi Arabia that migrated north and ended up uh, settling in areas. At first they were migratory. They were like so many Bedouin tribes. They would travel back and forth. They didn't settle in one place. In fact, um, Apparently, they were afraid if they settled in one place that they would be conquered. As long as they kept moving, as long as they were migratory, then they wouldn't be conquered by anybody else. Until they finally found Petra and said, well, this is a place we can easily defend. There's no danger of us being conquered. Uh, the, the Nabataeans were famous for being merchants. They were traders. I'm going to show you some trade routes here. But from the earliest time of history, this is a map that I showed you earlier during the time... Of so after Solomon, King Solomon, when we had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. This is before the northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria, and we talked about that, and the southern kingdom destroyed by Babylon. But 
Look down here, the Nabatu tribes, which had, again, most scholars think had come north from the Arabian Peninsula, existed at that point. Now, I want you to notice this is the border of their area. We've got the Edomites, the Moabites, the uh, Arameans, the Ammonites, etc. Those are all sort of biblical names. Those were tribes that existed back then. The dividing line for the Nabatu um, territory is right here. It's on the lower end, equal to the lower end of the Dead Sea. Later on, we have the Nabataean tribes growing. In fact, now their uh, area of control is well north of the Dead Sea. The Nabataean kingdom, because they were traders, they were very well. They became very wealthy. They controlled trade routes all over this part of the world. In fact, when we were in Oman, you saw all the frankincense, right? They were the primary traders that were responsible for bringing frankincense from south in Arabia and bringing it up north so that it was used in, in homes as sort of de, uh, de deodorizer or air freshener. It was used in temples and churches and all sorts of things. So the Nabataeans continued to grow. They continued to develop their empire because of their wealth. Eventually, Nabatea went all the way north, and in fact, later on, even after this time, they controlled all the way up to Damascus. They controlled from there all the way over to the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And this is why. These are some of the trade routes they controlled. Uh, all the way down into the area of Yemen and Oman, over to the Nile River, and all the way over to, in fact, they were at one point responsible for a lot of the trade routes like the Silk Road further north. Uh, because of their success as traders, they traded in spices, incense, gold, animals, iron, copper, sugar, various kinds of medicines, ivory, perfumes, and fabrics. At first, they were camel caravan traders. Later on, using the Omani Dows, remember those ships, this, the boats that we saw? They were trading as far away as China, bringing in goods, taking goods there. They um, became very, very wealthy. This is another a more specific uh, idea of their trade routes. Again, from Oman, Yemen, all the way over into North Africa. This was the Aksum. It was a great kingdom in North Africa, the Aksumite kingdom. Over into Egypt, all of these were the trade routes they controlled. Now, these trade routes became very much desired by other powers, especially the Romans. Later on, the Romans conquered this area under Pompey, but they knew a good thing when they saw it. The Romans did not uh, control the Nabataeans, they just taxed them. They said, you keep doing what you're doing, you keep getting rich, and Pompey came in in 63 BC, and just pay us taxes. So later on, this is under the Roman world, they created a province down the hill called Arabia Petraea. Petraea, based upon uh, Petra. And then um, the territory out in the desert, they named Arabis Nabataea. Again, named after the Nabataeans. So the Romans came in, they controlled this, they taxed the Nabataeans because they were very wealthy. And the Nabataeans particularly were uh, illiterate people they had an alphabet. Now, they didn't write things on, if they wrote them on uh, parchment or in leather, things like that, those things are all gone. The examples we have of their writing today is all carved in stone. There are a lot of stone carvings of writing in Petra, but in other places as well. We know how far they stretched in terms of their areas of control because we have stone carved writings and inscriptions. They especially, most of the writings we have, we have over 4,000 of them in Petra, um, most of them had to do with when somebody made a donation to one of their temples, they would have their name written on there, just like we do it today. All of these you know, marble walls and museums and things where people donate, they would write their name down, well, they did that there. It's interesting, these columns, this is ancient Aramaic. Aramaic was the day-to-day -day language that they spoke in Jesus' time. It actually was, was developed from the Babylonian language, Chaldean, because the Jews had been in captivity in Babylon, the people started speaking the Babylonian language, which was Chaldean or Aramaic. So this is Aramaic. The third column over here is Arabic. It is believed that Nabataean may have been the transition language between the ancient Babylonian language of Aramaic and the modern language of Arabic. So they think linguistically Nabataean was very, very important. 
This is their alphabet down here, and then some uh, examples of the written language. It's kind of strange to me, as I've, as I've studied this some, that their, their letters are sort of cursive. And yet, you know, which means cursive isn't usually what they would carve into stone. It's hard to curve, to carve curved letters. And yet, these are examples of carvings in stone of the cursive uh, Nabataean language. As I said, we have examples of that all over the Middle East. We know how far they, they traveled because we have examples of their writing in those places. I mentioned that they have a lot of examples of the writing happening on um, in temples and religious sites. The Nabataeans were very religious. They had a pantheon of deities. A pantheon meaning they had multiple gods. Uh, their two most important gods, remember when I talked about religion and I said, Usually it was the, the sky god, which was thought of as male because of the power of thunder and all of that. And then the fertility god, the Nabataeans were right there. Their primary god was called Dushara, the lord of the mountains. He was the sky god. He was the powerful one. Then they also worshipped a goddess called Alat, who was the fertility goddess. They had a moon goddess and, a, and various other gods in their pantheon as well. But one of the strange things about their uh, deities is they seldom represented them, at least early on, with human characteristics. In fact, this is a little unusual, but you know it's a square, notice it's a square block. When you go to Petra, as you go through, down toward the Sikh and through the Sikh, when you get inside Petra, in a lot of places, you'll see these niches that will have just what look like blocks in there. Um, sometimes they'll have really fancy carved and inside it there will be one or two or three blocks. They had sort of a the three primary gods they had which was the uh, the sky god or sun god Dushara, the fertility goddess Alat, and then the moon goddess and so they often will have three of these blocks. Those blocks represented their deity. Later on they started sort of putting faces on them making them a little more personal but you'll see these everywhere. Another thing they would do is create these standing stones. Now this is not a piece of stone that was carved and set up there. The mountaintop used to be higher than this and they carved everything else away. So this is actually the bedrock that's sticking up there. This, these blocks, in fact there's a Greek historian who wrote and said, I saw their gods and they were just blocks of stone. And so you'll get a lot of these kinds of niches with stone blocks in there. Those are called betels, or sometimes called jinn blocks, D-J-I-N. But Betel is the usual name. God blocks is sort of the, the general name for them. So you'll see these kinds of things everywhere get going into and inside Petra. Later on, they, like most of the cultures in this part of the world, were influenced by the Greeks. Alexander came through. He conquered everything. The Greek language came to be used. And so at that point, they started creating a much more humanized version of their deities. This, the, this is the god Dushara the sky god, sun god. This is what they made him look like later when they were influenced by the Greek gods because of course the Greeks and the Romans, their gods look like people. And so this is actually a late Nabataean sculpture of Dushara, their primary deity. The Nabataeans were also very artistic. Obviously they were big on carving stone. They carved this whole city. And by the way, the city of Petra covers 400 square miles. And you get to walk over all of it. I'll give you a map in a minute. It's a huge area. You will not see it all. In fact, Carolyn and I are pleased to be going back because there were parts of it that we simply didn't get to see when we were here before. There's too much of it. So it's not like, I mean, people see that, that image of the treasury and they think that's it. That first building you see, that's just the entrance. That's just when you first come into it. They have carved stone heads, they have votive figures that are worshiping, that they, they have produced. They have some fairly intricate carving in their stonework. All, again, their deities were just stone blocks, but they have some very intricate carving. They created coins, they had their own coinage, and also um, decorative items like jewelry. These are uh, a pair of earrings. So a lot of various artistic kind of expression by these Nabataeans. How is it that they were able to be so successful in trading? Those, those routes that I just I showed you a minute ago, those trade routes, are right across the middle of huge deserts. 
Well, the reason that they were able to do all of that is because the Nabataeans' greatest skill was not carving or building cities or anything else. It was water management. The Nabataeans were brilliant hydrologists. They, there's not a lot of rain in this part of the world, although 2,000 years ago it was not quite as dry in the whole of the, the uh, Saudi Peninsula or the Arabian Peninsula or in the Middle East as it is now. It's, it's gotten drier. But this is a picture from as you go into Petra through the sea, through this canyon that we'll look at, along the side there are water troughs. And the Nabataeans develop expertise in collecting rainwater, directing it into reservoirs that they would create, and developing enough water in desert areas not only to save water so that they had it when they crossed the desert, they would create these reservoirs out in the desert. These are examples. They had the ability to make exact cubicle, and to, to an amazing extent, exact right angles. They would make these cubicle cisterns create systems that would direct the rainwater whenever it did fall in there, and they also invented a waterproof concrete. They would line these cisterns and reservoirs with waterproof concrete, direct the water in there, and seal the top, and they would have water whenever they wanted. Going out across the desert, they would create various kinds of um, these giant reservoirs, and then they would cover them over Again, they're sealed with waterproof concrete, and they would cover them over, hide them, and leave markers that only they recognized. Well, the Romans, even though they left them alone because they were doing so well and they could tax them and get benefit, the Romans kept trying to figure out, where are all your water sources across the desert? And they never did find out. In fact, they're still finding these kinds of things. This one has steps going out to, down into it. They, it's the middle of the desert. I mean, you can see this. They think this was a swimming pool. Uh -huh. That they not only used it for drinking water, but it was used for bathing. That they, you know, and so they would have these huge water sources. There's a story told about the Persian army under the general uh, Cambyses. The Persians were traveling across the desert, and they would travel for a day or two, and they're running out of water. Nabataean traders would show up on their camels with all of these goatskins full of water and sell it to them at an exorbitant price. They would not tell them where to get water. And so after they sold them all of their water at a huge price, they would ride off and a day or two later, when the Persians had, were running out of water again, the camel caravan of Nabataeans would show up and sell them the next load of water at a huge price. But they would never tell where these sources were. As I say, we are still finding reservoirs, or we, I'm not doing it, but people, are, the, 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 they're still finding reservoirs in the desert that they control. In Petra, you will notice that some of the, the buildings that are there, underneath some of them, there are cisterns, reservoirs for water as well. Um, so they were extraordinary water engineers. Um, and that's the thing that made them able to travel and to trade in places nobody else could survive. This is the, the modern country of Jordan, Israel here, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt down here. This is Petra. Petra is about 133 kilometers north as the crow flies from Aqaba, the port where we'll stop right there. It is um, a little closer to the Dead Sea than it is to Aqaba, but we will be taking um, a very comfortable bus up to visit Petra. This is all part, by the way, of the Great Rift Valley. Are you familiar with that? This is the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River is here. This is the Dead Sea. And then there is a deep wadi, or sort of valley, called the Wadi Arabah that runs from the Dead Sea down to the Gulf of Aqaba. The Gulf of Aqaba, as you know, is the northeastern arm of the Red Sea. You then have the Red Sea, and if you follow all of that, all of that is a giant geological formation called the Great Rift Valley. It then cuts across to Africa. Have any of you all ever been to Kenya? The Great Rift Valley cuts through the middle of Kenya, and you're driving along south of Nairobi, and all of a sudden you come to this cliff face where you're looking off into the distance. That is the geological formation of the Great Rift Valley, and it continues on down through Africa. It's one of the largest geological formations in the world. While the Wadi Araba is part of that, Petra was nearby that as well. Um, so, 
50 miles south of the Dead Sea, 133 kilometers north of Aqaba. This is a map, one map, and I'll show you another, and I think that you, you got sent to your rooms. Uh, this is what Petra looks like when you visit it. We will park over here. This is the visitor center. From the visitor center, we will walk down to, um, and this is all flat along the way. There are various gin blocks, these betels or god blocks. There are tombs along there that you can see. You'll often see a um, symbol of sort of like stair steps cut out of the stone. Those to the Nabataeans were symbols of, of um, upon death, of being able to step up to the heavens, all right, because the sky god, who was also the sun god, was their most important deity. So we start the visitor center, we walk down here, there are horses available. Um, the horses are paid for, they're included, uh, but take a few single dollar bills or whatever if you, you don't stop and get any Jordanian money in order to tip the, the, the guys who are leading the horses and stuff, they, want, they expect to be tipped. And so that's a good idea. Take a few singles with you. You then will have, uh, as I say, this area where there are gin blocks, the battle blocks, and tombs. This is Al Sikh, which is a canyon. I'm going to show you images in a second. You walk through, it's about a half a mile long, almost a kilometer, that you walk through this narrow redstone canyon. And then you come out here. The first thing you see when you come out of the Sikh is the Kazne, the treasury it's called. Um, fascinating. It's, it wasn't a treasury, it was a tomb, but the local legend was that this was a place where they kept money and everybody kept thinking that they were going to find, you know, that there was a potential in finding treasure there. There are various, as you walk from the, the Kazne down through here, there are buildings, you know, carved into the stone on both sides. There is an ancient um, Roman style theater but again, unlike the Roman theaters, they would take blocks of stone and stack them up to make the seats and the steps. This is all carved out of the raw rock. If you wish to, you come down here, there is the Colonnade Street. There is the Great Temple, which um, is just, it's not a whole temple now, it's just pillars and things. Um, up on the right-hand side, as you're going down there, there are the, the royal tombs where kings were buried. You will, there is a, there was a Christian church here, and they have mosaics as part of that. I'll show you pictures. And when you get down here, this is where there's a museum. That's where we will have uh, lunch later. If you wish, you can walk up on top of the mountain, the highest point, the monastery, which is called Al Dair. It's 900-ish steps, 900 and some steps. It is a steep climb. It's a workout. But we did it last time we were here. Uh, a lot of people did. And while it's, it's, um, it's a pretty good climb. It's not really, really steep. It takes its time going up there, but it's a workout. Don't do it if you're not comfortable with walking. But get up there. It's a beautiful building carved in the stone, and also you have, can look out over the valleys from up there. And there are other places. There's also the high place of sacrifice, which is the other direction from the treasury. So you can check that out. This is a little simpler version. From the visitor center, you walk down to the sea, which is the canyon that goes through. When you come out, you will see the treasury building is the first thing you see. Then you have the street of facades, the theater I mentioned, the royal tombs over on the right, the colonnaded street down to the museum, and if you wish, you can go up to Aldeir, the monastery. There are toilets in several places along here. There are cafes. We will be having lunch here uh, at the bottom of the hill below where, and there's a museum there, below the uh, path to Aldeir. Now, this is one of the images as you walk down to the sea. This is after the visitor center, before you even get down to Petra. You will see this sort of thing. They were tombs. You will notice that they have these carved blocks, which are um, representative of their deities. This is an example of the most primitive kind of carving that they did. This is early on in the Nabataean culture when they were at Petra. Um, you get down then to the sea. As I say, the Sikh is a half a mile long. It's uh, about almost a kilometer. You can take carts down through there. There are horses that will go down through there. This canyon, in places, is over 300 feet high. And there are places where it almost touches at the top. It is 20 feet wide in places, a little wider in others, a little narrower in others. But it averages about 20 feet wide. And as you go through here, you'll see this little ridge right here and right there. Notice as you go in that there are channels for water on either side. There are some places, most of them are gone, but there are some places where there are ceramic uh, pieces that have been made to cover it, to 
keep dirt out of it and also just to keep it, from, you know, the evaporation, make it slower. There are places where the, as the water flows, it'll be flowing along in this cut rock channel, and then there will be a deeper place, maybe a meter long. That was a filter. What would happen is the water would flow over that, and if there was any sediment that had gathered in it, when it goes over that area, the sediment would fall down to the bottom of that, and then the cleaner water would keep going. Mm -hmm. And then at various places, they have cisterns where this would be gathered. As you walk through the seat, there are places where there are uh, small canyons that go off to the side where you can see the evidence of, because this would have been a, a, a torrent, a, a, this was created by torrents of water in ancient times. You'll see where water has come down into that, and in every case where there would have been water that flowed off the mountains, the Nabataeans identified those places and created systems for collecting that water and it, directing it to where they wanted it. Um, this is what you see when you first step out of the seek. In fact, you'll get a glimpse of just part of it as you approach the end of the seek. This is al Kazne, the treasury. Um, several images of it here. You, these are people. So you get some idea the size of this thing. It's 80, let me, uh, 82 feet wide and 128 feet tall. All of it carved out of stone. It's not built, it's carved out of raw rock. Um, inside, and you cannot go inside anymore because they were having, so many people were tra tracking in and out, they were wearing out the floors. And so you're not allowed to go in anymore. But inside, there is a, a first chamber that you would go into, and then there are three chambers off there, a large one and two smaller ones. It wasn't a treasury. They, they're quite certain now it was a tomb for one of the kings of the Nabataeans. Uh, they believe it might have been Aratus IV, who was one of their most prominent kings, and he had two wives. That's why they think there are three chambers off the, the vestibule when you first walk in. Um, this is an example of their later art, because unlike just being raw blocks, this has got all kinds of different Greek and Roman imagery carved into it, because those cultures had influenced the Nabataeans later. There are Corinthian columns, there are reliefs of the, the twin gods, Castor and Pollux, a carving of the, Greek, uh, the Egyptian god Isis, axe-wielding Amazons, griffins, eagles, winged victories, vegetation, poppies, grapes, royal rosettes, which is why we think that it was a royal tomb, because the rosettes were the sign of royalty. Um, because it was called a treasury, the local people for a long time thought that there was money somewhere here. And in fact, this central uh, cap, if you could look closely at it, it's full of bullet hole marks, bullet pop marks, because some of the Bedouins thought that the, there was money and that it might be hidden here. So they used to shoot at it to try to break it, thinking if they did, that all this gold would pour out. Well, there's no indication that there's any riches there at all, but that was, the, that was what they believed, and so they used to shoot at this, uh, the top of this extraordinary building. This is one of the best preserved of all of the buildings in Petra, because it is set, as you can see, it's set back into the stone, so the wind, and when it does rain there, the rain doesn't hit it as much, and so it hasn't suffered as much from erosion. Some of the other buildings are, are quite badly eroded over the years. But again, 80 some feet wide, 128 feet tall, it is huge. As you move along down through Petra, as I say, it's 400 uh, square miles in total, but there's a, cl a clear path to go down. You will see various places. These are some of the royal tombs. These were lesser tombs below. Uh, in fact, in one place, th this is the theater over here. There are tombs which they put the theater in later, and when they were carving out for the theater, they ended up shearing the front off some of the tombs, so they're now open. I assume they got rid of the bodies first, if they were in the tombs. But this is looking out from some of the, there are, the crudest of the dwelling places there are just carved back in the rock, or in some places it looks like they're water eroded, and people would live back in there. Sometimes they would go back with what nature had eroded, and they would finish it some. This again is an example of some of the, the older, more primitive kind of carvings. And again, you get a scale of the, you know, these are, these are people. So these things are enormous. These are some of the royal tombs and they follow along the right hand side as you're going down. Um, you can go up and look in those and visit them. This is another of the royal tombs. And you can see from the very crude sort of block-like carving, even though it's very well done, to the much more refined columns and uh, the capitals on tops of the columns and things like that. That came from a later period. This is some of the more primitive or earlier kind of carving that they would have had. Some of these are dwellings, some of them are tombs. At one point, there were as many as 30,000 people 
living in this city. Um, they continued to live there. The, the, the entire city was about a thousand years it was active, from about the 5th century BC to about the 5th century AD, but 200 years, the 1st century a a BC and the 1st century AD was when it was most in its uh, heyday. That was when the Nabataeans were at their greatest strength. The, one of the kings, who was the king in the late 1st century AD, um, the, the Romans had conquered all of this area, they were in charge, and they, they started pushing more and more and more on the Nabataeans. The king, who was the king at the end of the first century, promised the Romans if they would leave him alone and leave the Nabataeans alone, that when he died, he would will the city to them. He was the absolute ruler of the king. So in 106, he died, and Rome officially took control. That's when they ended up navy, naming the whole region um, the Ara uh, Arabia Petraea, when they actually owned all of this. But you'll see these are all dwelling places and tombs over here. This is the monastery, Al Dair, up on top of the mountain. And um, again, quite extraordinary. This is out. Uh, this is a guy, better him than me, sitting right there. So that gives you an idea of the size of this thing. All of it, the, and the way they did this is, in most cases, they figured out they would start at the top and start carving down. And like all of the rooms inside these things, it was solid rock, and they would just start chiseling it out. They'd say, okay, this is wide enough, and then we'll go straight down, and they would be ejecting the broken rock as they chiseled all this stuff out of there. Um, so, again, better him than me. Um, you can go up. This one you can go into. There also is a little coffee area. You can get coffee or tea. There's a little restaurant there, um, the locally run, and so you can, you can do that. Now, up until... Um, Fairly recently, you know, maybe 10 years ago, at night, the Bedouin peoples would actually come in here and live here. They stayed in these areas. And then finally, the government of Jordan, because there was a lot of damage, the tourists are not allowed into most of the buildings, a lot of the buildings now, and the Bedouins were told, you can't live here anymore. So they have to leave at night, but in the morning they will come back, and they have camels you can ride and horses you can ride. I mentioned to you that the New Zealand nurse who wrote the book, um, you know, married to a Bedouin, uh, she will be there, okay, assuming she's not on vacation in Dubai, as I said, and so you can purchase one of her books and get her to sign it if you want. So they have shops, you can purchase various kinds of souvenirs there. Um, this is, there are places that are an example of the later Christian influence. In fact, the um, Al Dair, the, this at one point, there was a church that met in that building. And so there were, Christ, there were later Christian influences these are the mosaic flow of the floor, a very Roman-influenced church. That's one of the things that Carol and I didn't get to see when we were there before, so we want, we want to look forward to that. But there are all these different periods of time that various people were in charge and that you see reflected. This is a very Roman kind of mosaic area. So that is the ancient city of Petra, the Nabataeans. Do you have any questions about any of that? Yes? Ross, well, about what time do we get to the, the treasury? And what time of day would be a good time to try to take a picture of the treasure? Well, the, the best pictures are always early in the morning and late at night. It's funny. When you used to buy film, the film instructions were always best to take pictures in the middle of the day when the light's brightest. That's completely wrong. So um, if you really want to get good quality pictures, I, we got there probably 10 in the morning, something like that. And we will spend most of the day, you know, till late afternoon. We'll come back to the buses and then get back, you know, get back to the boat from there. Um, I can't really tell you the best time to take pictures of the various things. This is usually not in direct sunlight, but that's good. I mean, you can be, but the opening to the seek is directly across from it. And so if you get back around the opening of the seek, you've got a, a, a good shot of the front of the treasury. If you go up to the monastery, there's a lot, you know, there are not that many people that walk all the way up to the monastery. You've got a lot of room up there that you can you can climb up because there's, I told you there's a little restaurant here. You can get tea and coffee and stuff. If you walk up the hill from that, you can get a good good shot down toward the Aldeir, toward the monastery. And um, we'll get there late morning, and uh, I'd recommend that if you want to really try to get good light and shots, probably try to get your best pictures right then because when you get to midday, you know, early afternoon, then it's going to be 
brighter and you don't get as good an image then. I'm giving you photo instructions now, but yes. I was wondering, with, with all the carving, what did the Navicans do with all the rock and rubble? All the rubble. Well, as you go through here, there are huge piles of stone, and I'm sure a lot of that would be the what was left over when they carved that out, this out. It's not like, well, you can see it's very rough over here, okay? And like from the treasury over this direction, it's sort of, there's a rough kind of canyon and there's stone everywhere. I mean, there's a lot of places in any of these little ravines and canyons and stuff that they could have taken the refuge and dumped it out. So um, it's not like all of it is just building, 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 building. There's a lot of raw stone and canyons and rocks and stuff around all of that. Yes? You said the, uh, the large reservoirs in the desert, they covered, I assume they didn't have plastic pool covers. So. No, they didn't have plastic pool covers. What they would do is, as I said, they used ceramic in a lot of cases. In some cases, they would, uh, like what we saw, were completely open. Often what they would do is they would make an opening and then, you know, a, a smaller opening, and then they would dig out, you know, the reservoir and then cover the opening. So the ones that they've completely taken the top off of, so you can see, that's probably not what they were like originally. They would have a small opening, and then once they got down into the rock, then they would expand it so that then they could seal the top. And again, um, they believe that there are many, many, many of these water reservoirs in various places throughout the desert that we still have never found because there aren't any Nabataean, Nabataeans around anymore to tell us about that. But um, yeah, they were quite extraordinary in that regard. Yes? How long does it take to get to walk to the monastery? I'm sorry, what? How long does it take to walk to the monastery? Um, it took us about 45 minutes, um, as I remember. Forgive me if that's wrong, but I seem to remember about 45 minutes for us to walk up because it's a pretty pretty good climb. I don't take don't try it. You know, if you're up for it, it's worth it. If you don't walk a lot, or if you're not used to it, if you've got mobility issues at all, then I would not recommend you try getting up to the monastery. But it is worth getting up there if you're you know, and it's a good workout. Um, <laughs> Carol and I both walk a lot, and so we enjoy that. Yes? Do, you, do you know why the monastery is called the monastery? Well, it's because monastery or sometimes convent is what they they translate the the Arabic word, which is al dair. And it's believed that at one point it may have been an ancient site of worship, and then later on it was, as I say, used for a church for a while. They actually had carved a niche out in the back, which was kind of an altar place. And so it took on that. But then the treasury, Al-Kazne, is called the treasury, and it was never a treasury. It was a tomb. And so these names got attached later on. Okay? Yes? Are the Bedouins descendants of the Nebuchadnezzar? What's that? Are they descendants? The Bedouins, are they descendants of the Nebuchadnezzar? Well, the Nabataeans were Bedouins, but not all Bedouins are Nabataeans. Because you remember yesterday in the talk, I showed you all these different tribes? Well, the Nabatu tribes were probably a collection of some of those that kind of were in relationship with each other and then migrated north and created this. But the vast majority of the Bedouin tribes would not be necessarily related to them. They may all have some common ancestry as Arabic peoples. But um, so the Nabataeans were Bedouins, but not all Bedouins are Nabataeans. Make sense? Over here, yes. Did they have any uh, agriculture or orchards? Yes, they had agriculture. In fact, that's a lot of what they had to use the water for, is growing things. And they had some extraordinary ways of doing that. Uh, for instance, they would create a shallow funnel and perhaps have one fruit tree that they planted there. And they used a particular kind of soil around the tree, a, a less kind of soil. Um, and what would happen is they would get a rain, the narrow funnel would direct the rain down to the tree and then the particular kind of soil they used would absorb the water and then sort of seal so that it kept the water in there. So with only one or two rains a year, that fruit tree would produce. And in various other ways, again, they had, they had kinds of irrigation. They were the geniuses about how to use water. And so they did grow a lot of their own food in, in places and then they also traded for a lot of it. You know, they would bring the things that the incense and various other things, metals, whatnot, that they would bring from elsewhere and they would trade it for food as well. So but they did grow their own food and they they were doing it in places nobody else could manage it because they knew how to how to solve the water problems. Yes? The time frame of the construction, the earliest reference we have to this is from the three hundreds, early three hundreds BC. It had already existed by then. We believe that the city had been there from about the 5th century BC. Now that's the first written reference we to it. We have to it. The natural part of it though, like the, the narrow canyons and it's it's protected even if there weren't any carved buildings there. So we think there may have been people there much more ancient times in terms of staying in that area. But the city 
we believe, started around the 5th century BC, and then the high point was uh, 100 BC to 100 AD, and they continued to build during that time. Uh, yes, in the orange. Do we have any examples of the equipment they used? The tools they used? They didn't have any equipment. No. This is all done by hand. <laughs> I mean, they would use chisels wow. and mallets to carve out these enormous chambers and, and things. Uh, so it was very much sort of a, you know, chisel and, and mallet kind of thing to dig all of this stuff out. So very, very primitive tools. None of this <laughs> kind of stuff, okay? Yes? Are we on our own or do we have guides that go with small groups or how does that kind of work for us? You will have guides. In fact, everywhere we stop from here on out, you will have multiple guides. Usually what they'll do is they'll have one guide per bus. And like in this case, we had a guide that, that uh, last time we had a guide that walked down from the visitor center with our group and, and showed, pointed out things to us and described them, et cetera. And then all the way through uh, al Sikh, through the Sikh, pointing a skin, pointing out particular things like some of the jinn blocks, the betel blocks that, that represent their deities. And then once we got out to the uh, al Kazne and described all of that, then we were kind of on our own and then gathered again later. Does that sound right, Rob? Does that sound good? Okay, good. Uh, so you will have somebody explaining it to you, but at a certain point, after you get through the Sikh and out into Petra and they've described what's going on and sort of given you a, a layout, they will turn you loose and you can go and focus on what you want to focus on. And then we'll get back together. After um, the, the restaurant that is sort of at the bottom, it's at the bottom of the hill that the monastery, El Dair, is at, but it's sort of at the end of where you would walk down through the main channels. And it's pretty clear where the main roads go. Um, there is a restaurant down there. They have a very nice meal, so we will all eat together. And then after that, we will kind of start moving back up. And there will be carts and things available for people who have mobility issues that have reserved those. I think some of you have talked to Rob about uh, making sure you have something. From that restaurant, they can take you all the way back up to the visitor center, okay? Up, up, through, the, up through Petra, through the Seek, and back up to the visitor center. But if you, and if you need that, and you have not made those arrangements, is there still time, Rob? Yes. Okay, they can, you can still make those arrangements. Plus, there are always people there. There are people with horses and camels and carts. You can always book your own. Uh, and if you have any questions about how to do that, one of the guides that are with us, they can, they can uh, help you with that. Um, over here first, and then I'll get back to you. Yes? I put this. First place, what were these monuments used for? Right. In the second one, at a given time, you told us there were 30,000 people Right. Can we see any of these still left or the ruins of them? Oh, well, a lot of those places I showed you were dwellings. In fact, let me back up here. See this? Now, some of these were tombs. Some of them were, were homes. Um, when you get, like here, this is a picture taken from out of one of the, and it looked like it was natural erosion, but then they would go into these naturally eroded areas and they would chisel them out, and that would be their home. That's where they would live. So you've got a combination of homes and tombs. Some of the big areas, like this, is one of the royal tombs. And you'll see there are others along here. On the right-hand side, as you walk down through Petra, there's a series of these significant ones up on the hill. You have to walk up to them, but it's not hard to get to. So many of the grandest buildings, like al Khazneh, the treasury, was, um, we're pretty sure in terms of the Khazneh, were tombs. Um, some of the others, like the Al Dair, were, they believe they used it for worship. Later on, it was used as a church. So these, um, a lot of these places were would have been um, homes or tombs. Some of them may have been places they dwelt in, got turned into tombs later. But that's where they lived. And between twenty and thirty thousand people at its height were living inside this area. But again, it's four hundred square miles. There's a lot of space here. Okay. Yes. The hydrology in Rome and in Nabatia, were they, did they influence each other or was there a common hydrology expert or <coughs> yeah. culture that went both ways? I'm not aware of, and, and I'm, uh, I'm not aware of any way in which the Romans influenced the Nabataeans. By the time the Romans got there, which was in the first century, they were already flourishing, which means they had already mastered this a long time before that in order to be able to have all the trade routes and everything. Was now, there anybody the, they both learned from? Um, well, that's, I don't think they would have had a common source. You see, the Romans weren't even in this region until the so mid-first century. It was Pompey, and in fact, um, the, when 
the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Judah and took them off into captivity. That left sort of a vacuum. There was great farm, the great grazing lands and stuff that had been in that area. The Edomites, who before the Nabataeans lived in this area, the Edomites moved north. Edomites were descended from Esau, Jacob's brother, okay, twin brother. The Edomites moved north, and in doing so, they left kind of a vacuum, and the Nabataeans, who had been growing all this time, moved in. That's when they took over, um, the, which is 580s, was when the Israelites, uh, the, the people from Judah, were taken out, and the Edomites moved north. That's when they came over. That's why we say the 5th century was when they really established themselves there. They started developing this area. They said, you know, we, we didn't like the idea of being in one place, but this is a place we can defend, so we like it. And so that's when it really started growing. The Romans were not present there until 450, almost 500 years after that. And so I, I never say never, but uh, it's very unlikely they had any common source in terms of how to do this. And the Romans were in awe of the Nabataeans and what they were able to do. They kept trying to find out where are your water sources. But again, they wouldn't interfere with the trade because they were, the Romans were benefiting when they were in control from the taxing of all of this trading that they were doing. So I don't think they had any common source. And while the Romans had a lot of water, you know, they implemented aqueducts and all of that kind of stuff, they were not in an environment as inhospitable as this. You know, the Nabataeans, the extraordinary part of their water technology was they did it in a desert where there wasn't much water, and yet they figured out how to find it, how to capture it, how to direct it, etc. Yes? Mariel and I were in Petra about 20 years ago. Okay. And to direct a question about the best time to photograph. Please. Uh, we hired a guy who was ex-Jordan Le uh, Arab Legion, mm -hmm. and on horseback, the mountain facing Petra, we went up at, suns uh, at sunset, so the three of us on, on horseback, and we watched the sunset over Petra, wow. and it's something you do. Never, ever, ever forget. Right. See, so you all hear that. They were there 20 years ago, and they had a guide that, that was taking them around, and they went up on the mountain where they could overlook Petra, and they were there at sunset. Unfortunately, you won't be there at sunset. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much we can do, okay? But, um, but so that's why I'd recommend if you really want, if your interest is really doing photography, as early as we get there or right before we leave, probably that would be when the best times are. Yes, back here first. Yes. Uh, any evidence of livestock other than camels uh, in, in this? Uh, well, um, there are always goats. Goats are ubiquitous, all right? And um, I'm, not, I'm not aware that they had any cattle, uh, but I don't know that for a fact, but I'm not aware that they had any cattle in this area. Cattle are, are not easy to manage, and that's the reason you don't see a lot in this part of the world, is because they require more water, they require more feed. Goats and camels can survive on relatively little, and yet they both provide milk, they both will provide meat, but only once. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I've been involved in fundraising consulting, and I had, a, I had a, a sort of a mentor of mine once say that you know fundraising is like uh, is like having sheep. You can shear them any number of times, but you can only skin them once. <laughs> and so, but yeah, uh, <laughs> they have horses now, uh, but and and they probably had horses uh, to some extent earlier. But one of the things in ancient times. The horses, and in fact, if you, you know, in the Bible, if you ever read a reference to a horse, it's a reference to warfare. Because for the longest time, horses were only used for warfare. They weren't used for just riding. You used a camel or a burro, which they have burros there, you know, donkeys. Um, and then they have goats as well. So they had all of those kinds of animals, just like all other desert peoples have. The Bedouins, <laughs> as migratory people, they would always have herds of goats as well as camels and often burros and things like that. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, right here. Uh, you said there's a museum down here, the restaurant we're going to get. Right. Is it worth going to? I don't think we went in the last time because we, by the time we got back down from the monastery, uh, we ate lunch and then it was pretty much time for us to start moving off. So I can't say, to be honest, but um, check it out. I'm sure you'll be able to figure out pretty quick. Uh, up here, Paul? What's that? Well, the early, where did they get the inspiration for their architectural design? Early on, as, I, as you saw, it was very much just square blocks. And that's what they used to represent their deities as well as what the design of their homes were. And you can tell the early stuff because it is just square block. But that's obviously pretty natural. It doesn't take much inspiration to realize we're going to square off the corners of this, of this piece of stone and we think that'll be more attractive. 
Later on, as they were influenced by, you know, in the, the after Alexander came through, they were influenced by the Greek Hellenistic kind of culture because that, even though they were kind of kind of isolated, that carried over. And so you see Greek influence. That's why they have some of the Greek gods represented. You have Corinthian columns, that kind of thing. And then later on, the Romans. Uh, the Romans came in, and you see Roman influence, especially in the mosaics and some of those kinds of things. So. Based upon the different uh, kinds of designs you'll see from the very rough kind of didn't necessarily need to have a, a source for the design of the carved stone blocks to uh, Corinthian columns and various other kinds of uh, Greco design to some of the Roman influence and the mosaics and some of the carving as well, you can see the various periods of time as people came in and, and did influence them. So all of those were a factor. Yes? Is there any evidence of defensive structures that they felt they needed to be able to defend this city they built? There were not a lot of defensive structures, but as I say, they um, you saw the entrance. How many people would it take to protect that? Okay, You don't go over it. Now, there are other ways to get into Petra now, but for the most part, the protection was purely natural barrier, um, and it did not take much to protect. the. Um, early on, the Nabataeans did have a military capability. Later, by the time the Romans really came in there, in the, in the around the end of the first century BC, early uh, first century AD, they had lost a lot of their militaristic capabilities and even inclinations, and were much more pastoral in terms of animals and that sort of thing, because there had not been a big demand for that. There's not a whole lot of people, you know, coming through there. It's not like they were in the Mesopotamian Valley where everybody and their brothers marching through there wanting to take over. And so they they had had some military capability earlier on. Later on. They sort of lost all of that and eventually just sort of melted away. You know, there are no more evident, there's no more Nabataeans uh, as, as far as we have any record of. Yes? Uh, in your slide there, it looks like people up on that level. Are we able yes. to access the exterior of the Yes, exterior? in fact, uh, this is, this is uh, up one of the tombs. And yes, you can walk up there. A lot of them you can go into. The one, because it's the first one everybody sees when they come out of the seat, the, the uh, al Kazne, the treasury, everybody wanted to go in that one because when you first walk out there, you don't see all the rest of this stuff. And they finally had to say nobody else can go in there because it, you think, well, it's stone. Well, you get hundreds of thousands of people you know, walking on stone and eventually it starts wearing out. But there are a lot of other places like Aldi or the monastery and the royal tombs and others that you can go into them. Now, there's not, you know, they're usually just chambers in there. It's not like you go in and they've got a spinet piano and they've got you know grapes and all that kind of stuff. It's there, it's there's raw rock at this point, but you can go into the chambers on a lot of the buildings. Yes. Right. The reason they left is because um, well, first the Romans, as I told you, the the last great king there, um, he willed it to the Romans, and the Romans sort of took over. And the, we, don't, we don't have exact details about why they completely abandoned it, but the, apparently they did not abandon it um, quickly. And the reason we say that is because they have found no evidence. Usually if somebody deserts a town because they're being attacked or because you know, there's a great a natural disaster or catastrophe or a plague or something that comes, they will find evidence of the fact they left in a hurry. They'll leave behind silver coins and personal items, things like that. There was no indication of that here, so we believe that it was abandoned calmly, slowly, over some period of time, and probably simply because the Romans now technically owned it, and they were controlling that area, and so the Nabataeans sort of went back to their their uh, nomadic kind of lifestyle and left the city, and then they actually just, you know, disappeared. They intermarried. They, there's, there's no more Nabataeans anymore. Yes? You said that there are now other ways to get into... Petra. Right. Uh, when they were there, was the seat the only reasonable way to get in? I guess you could have come over. Yeah, there. I, I know that there's other ways to get in because the people that work there now drive pickup trucks around, <laughs> around the site. Um, I'm not exactly sure what those ways are, but but there is an indication there are other ways to get in. Whether or not those were available, you know, 2,000 years ago or not, I don't know. Uh, but they. The, the primary way to enter, because it's the dramatic way, and it's the way that, that was their primary entrance, is through the seat. But, th as I say, I, there's evidence that there are other ways that you can get in and out of there now, because the workers are in there. But I don't know if, if, they, if that was a concern, if that got developed later, or what's going on. Okay, any other questions?
Thank you all very much. Trust me, you're enjoying it. And we'll see you this afternoon.